Hey, future respiratory therapist, here with you. Got another couple of videos. Took a little time off for the holiday break, but I'm back at it. I told you you guys got questions. I'm going to get answers to you. Now, the first thing I want to say is I've got lots of questions about the changes to the TMC tips on the Clean Sims, things like that. Let me tell you, those are big topics. I'm currently reviewing the new 2020 matrix and comparing it to the old MBRC matrix. So hopefully I'll have a have a kind of a summary on what I see the biggest changes in that area coming for you um, here sometime soon. But it's not something I can just put out there. Here you go right now. Okay, so I'm working on that. Just bear with me. I'm going to get that out for you here. Okay, today I got two questions I'm going to address both of them because they're both pretty short. Uh, the first one comes from, again... Do the best I can with some of these names. Is it Bope or Bopet? But they want me to explain uh, these two modes of mechanical ventilation. So it's SCMV is the first one. And then the second one is APV CMV. Now when you talk about these two modes, you got to understand that ventilators are like different modes of cars. Like... I drive a Tundra, a Toyota Tundra, okay? But if somebody said, hey, I need you to go pick this up for me, and I want you to take my truck, but they drive a Ford F-150, then as a respiratory therapist, I have to be able to adapt to that vehicle, okay? So I can't say, oh, no, I'm sorry, I can't do it because I only know how to drive a Toyota Tundra. You have to understand that the... The Ford F-150 is going to do the exact same thing that the Toyota Tundra does. It's just going to have different names for different things and things are going to be in different places. And that's how you have to think about mechanical ventilation. When you're in your school, you're going to learn how to manage ventilators in your clinical sites. But if you go to work at a facility who doesn't have those same ventilators, then you can't use it as an excuse for the, a weak performance. You have to be able to adapt. You have to go, okay, I'm familiar with this vent. This is just a new ventilator. It does the same thing. It's just going to do it differently in the sense of the nomenclature of the modes, where the buttons are, how to find the settings, uh, you know, what alarms are set. Those vary sometimes. But essentially, it's all the same stuff. It's just in different places and sometimes called different things. Well, this is a prime example of this question right here. So when you ask me this question, you're probably talking about the Hamilton G5, maybe the C3, uh, but you're talking about these, this nomenclature that is very familiar. If, I, if, if you had no idea of what you were doing with, if I said, hey, I want you to put the patient in SCMV, you would say, I don't know what that mode does. You need to teach me what this mode does. Well, let me tell you what it is, okay? S CMV stands for synchronized continuous or synchronized controlled mechanical ventilation. That's it. Synchronized controlled mechanical ventilation. What that's telling you is that the patient is going the, the ventilator is going to deliver a controlled set of mechanical ventilation. Whatever is set is what the vent is going to do. But if the patient wants a breath, either before or after a breath is given, the vent's going to synchronize with that patient's effort. Now, because this is CMV, every breath is going to be controlled by the vent. This is the same as assist control in most other mechanical ventilators and probably more in tune with the nomenclature you learned as a student. Assist control. What does assist control do? You set the tidal volume, you set the flow, you set the rate. If the patient does nothing, it'll get the set tidal volume at the set flow at the set rate. If the patient asks for a breath, if the patient triggers a breath via pressure or flow triggering, then the vent says, oh, you want a breath? Here you go. Here's a tidal volume of 400 at a flow of 50. And they get that breath. So these two are the same. Now, if you look at your vent, if you're standing in front of the vent, you're like, how do I know, Joe, that this was not SIMV? How do I know this is AC and not SIMV. Well, the answer to that is if you look at the modes on your ventilator, there's another option on the Hamilton ventilators that says SIMV. So that operates like SIMV. The patient can take true spontaneous breaths in between controlled mechanical breaths. So when you see this SCMV, understand that it is the same as assist control. 
Okay, the patient can initiate breaths, but the vent is in control of what those breaths look like in terms of tidal volume and flow. Okay, if the patient doesn't breathe, then the vent's going to deliver the next breath based off of a time cycle. Okay, so that's SCMV. Now, APV CMV is the same as PRVC. Okay, adaptive pressure ventilation. That's what this stands for, adaptive pressure ventilation. Now, the reason they say adaptive pressure ventilation is because the pressure adapts to the feedback it receives from the, from the patient. So just like PRVC, remember we did a video over PRVC and we talked about what makes PRVC, PRVC, pressure regulated volume control. We set a target tidal volume. We set an eye time, and we use our high pressure alarm limit as our max pressure to deliver. The vent gives a test breath. It assesses plateau pressure, static compliance, and then the next breath, it delivers a pressure in an attempt to achieve your target tidal volume. That's different than AC. AC, the pressure will go through the roof because the tidal volume will be delivered. But in PRVC, if you're working with the Hamilton, APV CMV, then pressure will adapt. If you tell the vent to give 400 mLs tidal volume, and the, the vent gives a breath, a pressure controlled breath, and that tidal volume comes back at, a, at a tidal, an XL tidal volume of 290, then the vent says, oh, I'm trying to get to 400, so I need to increase the pressure. With the increase in pressure, you should get an increase in volume. And it will increase the pressure in very small increments until that target tidal volume has been reached. And when that target tidal volume is reached, then it holds the pressure there. Now, if the lungs, patient's lungs start getting better, and it gives that breath, and the breath comes back, exhale tidal volume of 510, then the vent says, oh, wait a second, target tidal volume is 400, and now I'm coming in at 510. And the vent says, we need to adapt to this. We need to turn the pressure down, decrease the pressure, because if you decrease pressure, you'll decrease tidal volume. And so it'll do that automatically, and it, it moves, it's constantly moving. This is closed-loop ventilation. Okay, this is where some, the ventilator initiates a breath, it receives feedback from the patient and makes an adjustment for the next breath. That's closed loop ventilation. AC is a type of open loop ventilation, which means it doesn't close, which means what the vent does, does not, is independent of anything that comes back from the patient. So, so there you have it. That's the SCMV, which is the same as assist control, and APV is the same as PRVC, okay? I hope this helps. Let me know if it doesn't clarify that for you and I'll get another one out, hopefully to clarify a little more for you, okay? Um, the other question comes from Mark in Holland and he wants to talk about driving pressure. Uh, they use a lot of pressure control ventilation. And so the question is, first of all, driving pressure. Why is it important? Driving pressure has been closely linked to reducing ventilator-induced lung injuries, okay? So decreasing driving pressure equals decreased VILI. That's a ventilator-induced lung injury. That's the first thing you need to understand. If, you, if you're going into the field of respiratory therapy, you need to understand that driving pressure is going to be talked about in the very near future if it's not already being talked about. Some places it's there now. Some places are lagging behind. But it's going, it's, it is the future, especially when we talk about ARDS and, 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 and ventilator-induced lung injuries. Driving pressure is lots of promising data showing that driving pressure is a difference. Now, what is driving pressure? Driving pressure equals plateau minus peak. Okay, so plateau minus PEEP. Now, that's pretty straightforward. You give a breath, you do an inspiratory pause, you get your plateau pressure. If it's 20, 
You subtract your PEEP from that. If your PEEP is 10, then you have a driving pressure of 10 similar to water pressure. And that's a good driving pressure. Most data or most research out there right now from what they've shown says that a driving pressure around 15 similar to water pressure or less is ideal to reduce the risk of ventilator induced lung injuries. So, so that's what driving pressure is. That's how you calculate it. Now the question is, is when you're in pressure control ventilation, does plateau always equal PIP? And the answer is yes. Your plateau is your PIP when you're in pressure control ventilation. You have to understand this. When you're in pressure control ventilation, you tell the vent to give a breath, raise it to this pressure, hold it, and then drop back down until the next breath. Okay? This is PIP. So let's say you're at 30. Now if you do an inspiratory hold, you say, well, just do an inspiratory hold. And see what happens. Well, here's what's going to happen. The inspiratory hold is going to keep this pressure right here because the vent is being told to hold the inspiratory effort that I told you to hold. So I told you to raise the PIP to 30. I told you to raise the, the peak inspiratory pressure to 30. Now I'm going to inspiratory hold it. What are you going to do? The vent's going to hold it at 30. It's not, you're not going to get that drop. I've done another video over this before. This is where the question actually came from. If you're in assist control, you're telling the vent to give a tidal volume of 400. But when you do that inspiratory hold at the end of that breath, the vent says, okay, well, I'm just going to hold this 400 in there. But because the air is no longer moving through the airways and is now settled in alveoli, you get a drop in your pressure. So in, in assist control, you get a rise. And then when you do your hold, you get a dip. And that dip is that 400 cc's settling into the alveoli without any air moving through the through the Airways. It's basically eliminate, eliminating airway resistance, and it gives you a clear picture of your stat of your plateau pressure, which you then can use to calculate your static compliance. Now, in pressure control, you don't get that dip. So, Mark, to answer your question, yes, plateau pressure is always equivalent to, to peak inspiratory pressure when you're talking pressure control ventilation. Now, how do we use driving pressure in pressure control ventilation to reduce ventilator-induced lung injuries? when we can't really get a true plateau pressure? That's a good question. And the best answer I have for you is that in that case, you would have to consider your PIP to be your, your, your plateau pressure. Because see, you still get a plateau pressure in pressure control. It's not a true plateau reading in terms of pressure differences. But there's still a plateau pressure. Remember, the plateau pressure is described as a, a cease in airflow and the amount of pressure held at the alveolar level without airflow. So if you look at your pressure control waveform, I'm going to leave the pressure control up. To, so this is, this, is your, this is your pressure waveform. If you look at your flow waveform, it was probably decelerating, and it looked something like this. Now you have to understand, flow went up to achieve this pressure, and then it decelerated. Now when it gets back here to baseline, that's telling you there's no airflow moving. The pressure has been reached and equalized and stabilized from the alveoli back to the, the endotracheal tube. And so the ventilator is not giving flow anymore. If it was, the pressure would go higher. But you see, it's not because it can't go higher than the set peak inspiratory pressure. So this is now your illustration of where your plateau pressure is happening. So this last section of your breath is actually a representation of a plateau, which means no air movement happening, pressure of the alveoli. Now, again, it's not the same type of plateau pressure that you get when you do assist control or SIV or any type of volume control ventilation. But in the definition of what a plateau pressure is, pressure in alveoli with the ceasing of air, with, 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 with no airflow, pressure inside the alveoli minus airway resistance, then you could say that you still get a plateau pressure because the flow has ceased to move and the vent is basically at this point just holding this pressure for the remainder of that, I, that set eye time. And that's the best thing you could use as a plateau pressure in pressure control ventilation. Now, can you use that to keep it less than 15? 
to reduce villain loose lung, lung injuries? I don't know. I really don't. I haven't seen any studies on it. Haven't done any practice on it myself. I just know that that that's that's the science behind pressure control ventilation. There is a plateau pressure. It's just not measurable in the same measure as volume control modes of ventilation. So I don't really know if that helped you or not. I think I clarified. Does plateau always equal PIP in pressure control? Yes, one hundred percent. How do we use it in terms of driving pressure? and villain induced lung injuries monitoring that i think the verdict is still out on that i think we need more studies on it i think there needs to be more research in that area to really find out okay so hey guys i appreciate you guys throwing those questions up mark if that didn't answer your question give me another message i appreciate you putting it up there um for the rest of you that have questions out there i'm getting them i'm getting to them they'll become posted very very shortly hope everybody's having a great holiday break um this is the day after christmas and so i hope everybody had a great time spending Christmas with your families and all that stuff. There's also a lot of sadness around this time of year. Uh, I had a cousin of mine who lost their grandfather just yesterday on Christmas, and my heart goes out to them. It's supposed to be a happy time of year, but it's not that way for everybody every single day. So just love on your family, love on your friends, and just enjoy the rest of your break. About to get back at it, hard at it, getting back to finishing up some of your final semesters, which is exciting times. And for the rest of you, getting back heading into your next several semesters so you got a couple of weeks left maybe 10 to 14 days depending on when you start back up before it gets real again okay so best wishes guys enjoy the rest of your break send me any questions let me know what you need from me talk to you soon